just start. There you go. Hopefully you can see my screen. And off we go. Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Agata Morka. I am Spark uh, Europe's communication officer and SCOS coordinator. And it is my pleasure today to moderate this workshop on the perils of being invisible. We will be talking about collective funding models for open science infrastructure. But before we proceed, I would like to get a sense of who is here with us in the room. So we have um, a small uh, Zoom polling for you. Uh, so Ilaria, if I could ask you to activate the Zoom, uh, the Zoom poll, that would be great. Um, and the question is, who do we have in the room? So please choose one group that is closest to you. So as you can see, we have different groups. So please choose yours. And I'm very interested in seeing how how this will go and which group will be represented more than others. Okay. I think I think everyone everyone voted by now. No, 69% only voted. So if someone else would like to still vote, that would be great. So far from what I can see, 30% for, for infrastructures. And somebody's apologies sorry. somebody's just posted in the chat that they can't see the poll um and i i don't know if you don't have the most up-to-date version of zoom you might not be able to use it but if you look at the bottom of the window there is an option to click on polls and that may you may be able to find it by clicking on polls thank you john that's very helpful i'm checking if something is uh ah, okay we have some movement happening here so 85% voted now, and um, it seems like we have 42% uh, for infrastructures, 25% for research institutions, 17% for libraries, 8% uh, for research funders, and 8% for other, which I am very uh, curious as to what other is. So if someone would like to tell us more, please uh, do so in, in the chat window. Um, I think we can end the poll now. Thank you, Ilaria. Thank you for that. Um, and um, let me let me properly start now. So here I can share results of the poll with you so that can everyone can see it. Um, so, okay, so I will stop now and get to the business of our workshop here. So uh, today we will talk about um, about something which is invisible. So we will talk about the invisible actor of the open science community, the open science infrastructure. Um, what um, what triggered um, the the need to to have this workshop? Um, I think is 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 a diff is a very interesting paradox that we observed. So um, although the scholarly community relies on open science infrastructures, um, it is very often without really realizing that there are operational and development uh, costs related to their existence. And these key infrastructures are typically managed by highly competent but under resourced teams who over deliver. And it is sadly very ironic that their hard work uh, renders their need for additional resources invisible. Um, hopefully, uh, well, fortunately, uh, many libraries uh, have started to actually collectively help raise funds for open science infrastructures. And one of the models that they use is um, through, um, through SCOS campaigns. So today we will hear from various stakeholders. We will have representatives of the um, open science infrastructures that were uh, supported in the second cycle of the SCOS, um, SCOS pledging round. And we will also hear from funders um, and uh, from a special guest today uh, from John Treadway, who will um, talk a little bit more about the, um, the survey that he uh, prepared uh, for, for our upcoming strategy, for the SCOS upcoming strategy. Um, so I would, like, I would like to introduce our panelists for the discussion here today. So I will start with Vanessa. So Vanessa Proudman is Director of Spark Europe and SCOS Executive Group Chair. And um, on a daily basis, I would like to say that she's working to make open the default in Europe. 
and uh, she has international experience working with many uh, leading universities, uh, university libraries worldwide, with research institutions, international policymakers. I am sure that you are all familiar with, with her work. She also authored many reports on open science, open science infrastructures, and open science publishing models. So welcome, Vanessa. And then we have three, uh, three representatives of the open science infrastructure supported by SCOS. I will uh, start with Niels first. So Niels Stern, uh, director of uh, OAPEN of uh, the OAPEN Foundation and co-director of the OAB. Uh, Niels um, uh, also, uh, I think, uh, doesn't need much introduction for, uh, for people from the open science community. Um, he uh, has acted as an independent expert for many European Commission uh, projects on open science and e-infrastructures. Um, he also um, acts as a chief negotiator for the National License Consortium for the Royal Danish Library. So welcome, Niels. Um, next in line, who do I see here? Next, Silvio. I can see Silvio's hair, so Silvio. Um, Silvio, um, Silvio Peroni is um, uh, associated with the University of Bologna and uh, the Department uh, of Classical Philology and Italian Studies. Uh, she ho he holds a PhD in computer science and he is a co-director of Open Citations, which is one of the infrastructures supported by, by SCOS. And finally, over to Alec. Um, so Alex Meher, who is Associate Director of Development for the Public Knowledge Project. And he is the lead developer for all PKP software and the PKP web application library. And I hear, uh, well, Alec, first of all, thank you for stepping in today here. Um, and uh, I hear that other than developing software, you also like to run marathons or at least that's, uh, that's uh, what can be found uh, on you uh, in our various sources. Um, good, so those were representatives of, the, of all the infrastructures for us here today. And then let me uh, now introduce Jean-Francois Lutz. Lutz. So uh, Jean-Francois, welcome, um, head of digital library, uh, Université, Université de Lorraine. Uh, Jean-Francois uh, also served as um, Spark Europe's and Couperin's uh, board member and worked extensively on open, uh, open access and open science. And last but not least, our special guest for today, John. Um, so John Treadway, uh, director, Great Northwood Consulting. John uh, worked for the Nature and Hold Spring Publishing Groups, as well as for Digital Science. Uh, where he was the chief operating officer for four years. And for SCOS, he has conducted extensive research, um, uh, including uh, a big survey on which he will comment uh, later in this session. So here is everyone. I hope that I have not uh, forgotten about any of you. Um, to the audience now, I just want to tell you a little bit about the agenda for today. We have a pretty packed one. Uh, we will start with the intro to SCOS, and then uh, John will present um, the SCOS survey results. And um, the the final part of the of of the workshop will be based on on a discussion. We would very much uh, like to discuss also with the audience. So please feel free to interact. If you have a question, please raise your hand and do um, do engage with us. Because the last thing we would like this to be. Uh, would be a lecture and uh, you know all of us talking to each other rather than engaging with you. So that's it and now I will proceed to the intro to SCOS part uh, of the presentation which hopefully will work. Um, so I hope that you can see my second slide here. Great, perfect. Okay, so a very, a very, very short intro to SCOS, assuming that perhaps not everyone is familiar with, with this initiative. So um, SCOS, Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. It's an, an, an initiative which is led by Spark Europe. And uh, the aim um, is uh, quite simple and yet uh, not banal. So what we, would, what we want to do is to help sustain the infrastructure to support the implementation of open science. So SCOS um, actually works on uh, coordinating um, a cost sharing framework, which enables institutions to collectively fund open science infrastructures. 
Um, in a way, it is um, um, a response to a certain challenge, of course, with the growing number of open access initiatives and uh, open science uh, infrastructures. They face, um, they face the danger and the risk of, of not being able to sustain themselves. And of course, if they cannot sustain themselves, they are um, they also risking stagnation, downsizing, or even worse, paywalling, um, which is, of course, not something that we would strive for because we want, of course, an, an, an equitable and an inclusive research culture, which is based on openness. Um, Next, um, next, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the report that uh, SCOS, um, SCOS uh, published last year. We were looking into the landscape of open science infrastructure and so we've, we have uh, observed an alarming situation there. So we asked the existing open science infrastructure, how long would they remain viable without grants? And as you can see, uh, Mm, the answers uh, were rather worrisome. Uh, so more than 45% said that they, they would be able to sustain themselves for more than a year. But at the same time, there was almost 20% of them who said that they wouldn't last more than a month. So of course, this is uh, a situation um, that needs some action. And um, if, um, if no action is, is taken, of course, that comes with big Big, big risks uh, of losing capacity to influence of um, not being able to shape to shape the future of open uh, of the open science community. So SCOS in a way um, is one of the solutions to this situation. So how we work, uh, we are um, our initiative is community led and uh, governed, and what we do is um, as you can see on this diagram. And very simply put, uh, so SCOS um, mm, vets um, all, all as non-for-profit infrastructures before then recommending them to the open science community so that uh, the consortia or individual institutions can support them. And um, just a, a very important note here, um, SCOS, uh, we do not take any money from the institutions. The financial, uh, financial transactions are uh, done directly between the, cons the, the institutions uh, or consortia and the infrastructures themselves. So what SCOS does, we actually facilitate this, um, this exchange and we make sure that we, assess, um, that we assess funding needs and that we um, are able to choose infrastructures which we think are crucial for, uh, for the, the open science um, landscape to flourish. Um, in terms of SCOS members, uh, we have many big organizations who are supporting us. You will see here uh, on the slide, we have, um, we have library consortiums, we have associations. You can see that they come from all over the world. We have, uh, we have uh, initiatives coming from, um, from Australia. We have um, institutions supporting us in France. We also uh, have people in Canada supporting us. So, um, and uh, the Association of Young African Universities, who is also engaged with, with SCOS. So as you can see, we managed, hopefully, I think I can say so, that we managed to activate the community um, and um, raise awareness of these invisible infrastructures and their needs, their needs for funding. Um, so far, uh, 283 institutions have pledged from 19 countries. Uh, we have supported six infrastructures so far, and we are very proud to say that we, we managed, we facilitated um, uh, pledging, which uh, amount to over 3.3 million euros. Um, for, the, for, for now, we had two pledging cycles. So we had the first one pilot cycle where we were asking for support for Sherpa, Romeo and the OAJ. The OAJ has re reached it, uh, its target and Sherpa Romeo is still, uh, is still getting there. We are currently at 43%. And of course, having said that, that some of the infrastructures that, mm, that we support, um, that they've reached the target, it doesn't mean that they don't need your support anymore. This is an ongoing operation. 
you will, I will show you now for the second funding cycle. Um, just this summer, we had re we received very good news that uh, the DOAB and uh, OAPEN Foundation that they have also reached their target. But again, just reaching a certain target does not mean that this guarantee their sustainability. So it's always the first step in a very in a much longer longer journey. Um, we have two other infrastructures represented in the second funding cycle. So we have open citations. Uh, as you can see, they still need your support and the same stands for PKP. PKP is currently at 42% of their target and uh, open citations at 28%. And um, we are just uh, about to announce the third pledging round. So please stay tuned. That can happen uh, pretty much any day now. Um, and we have also um, really interesting projects that we will be uh, bringing to your attention in the in the third funding cycle. Um, coming back to the main uh, to the main topic here, so the, the the idea of the invisibility of these infra of these open science infrastructures. Um, Scott has interviewed Marion Dacos, so one of the very important open science, open access uh, advocates, and I very much liked uh, how Marion put it uh, when asked about open science infrastructures. Uh, he said, you absolutely need it, uh, but you don't see it unless it's broken. Um, and I think that uh, for today, the, our one of our goals is to see it before it's broken, and to find a way of supporting these uh, these open science infrastructures. Um, I will now hand over to John, uh, who, um, who helped SCOS reflect on, on, on where, where we are, where we are going. Um, and uh, I will ask him to present um, his findings and the findings that, um, that will be uh, the basis of our upcoming strategy, so the new SCOS strategy, which will be released in autumn of 2021. So John, over to you. I will make sure that um, that I change your slides. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, I can tell. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you very much for having me, everyone. We're going to move relatively quickly through some high level findings of the survey. Um, as Agatha said, this is a survey of stakeholders from across the research, set, research sector, asking them about their level of awareness of open science infrastructures and SCOS and the way it operates and their opinions about how it could provide support. Uh, we had specific sections targeted at the providers of open science infrastructure and um, institutions that pledge funds via SCOS. And there were in total 217 respondents, although not every respondent was asked to answer every question and not every respondent did answer every question. Um, we've supplemented that survey by um, focus groups, um, six focus groups with over 30 attendees and then 20 or more said um, semi-structured interviews with a range of individuals across the um, research infrastructure and uh, some of those represented on the panel today and I think maybe in the attendees, so hello to those. Um, so I'm going to do uh, an overview of that survey results and they're augmented with some of the findings from the um, focus groups and the interviews that we conducted. Agatha, if you wouldn't mind moving ahead. So the, uh, the results of the uh, survey were, as I say, 217 respondents in total. Breaking that down, we had the largest number of respondents from Europe. Um, and France provided the highest number of those, uh, around 15% of the total, but there were many other European nations where we had uh, one or one to five percent of the total number of respondents came from there, the long tail of European nations as well represented. Canada was the highest number of respondents from any single country, and you see North America is the second highest region in terms of responses, and then Australia, the USA, Qatar uh, were the only other countries outside of Europe uh, to provide 5% of the total respondents. A large minority of the respondents had authority over budgets from which uh, infrastructure can and could be funded, about 40%. And uh, 13 respondents were representing organizations that had previously submitted an application to SCOS and 44 represented organizations that had pledged funding to one or more of the SCOS uh, initiatives. Uh, Agatha. Thank you. Um, so the first question, uh, we asked a broad range of questions to gauge familiarity uh, of the 
respondents had with open science infrastructure in general and then SCOS itself. And around 89% of respondents express some familiarity with open science infrastructure. Um, when I say some familiarity, I mean either they are extremely familiar or very familiar or somewhat familiar. And you can see the breakdown here. Um, respondents based in Europe and North America were most likely to be uh, extremely or very familiar with open science infrastructure than those based elsewhere. And respondents from institutions that, that pledge funds are less likely to be extremely or very familiar than respondents from other organisations, which is a slightly surprising finding because we might have expected that institutions that pledge funds are very familiar with open science infrastructure. Apologies, if you could just jump back one slide, Agatha, I've just realised I forgot to draw attention to one point on the previous slide. And I'm going to return to this point, so I'm going to flag it. Um, the majority of respondents were university libraries, representing university libraries at 53%. And there were another 6% who represented another type of library, quite a wide range of those. Then there were a large percentage from uh, research intensive universities and some other format, and, and a range of other organisations were represented. Um, I, I draw attention to that for two reasons. I'm going to talk about the difference between university library respondents and others, and also just to flag again, here that actually this is quite representative of SCOS's, um, the people most engaged with SCOS. So the geographic responses and the type of organisations represented is quite representative of the membership of SCOS. So that's an interesting finding in itself. Agatha, if you could skip ahead to the next slide, um, that would be, uh, so then we, we talked about familiarity with open science infrastructure, and then we asked respondents about familiarity with SCOS itself. And with 89% of respondents familiar with open science infrastructure, that fell to around 65% of respondents who expressed some familiarity with SCOS and less of those were extremely or very familiar with 41% being somewhat familiar. The only respondents, in fact, that were extremely familiar with SCOS were from Europe or North America, and specifically Canada, France, the UK, and Netherlands. And the majority of those of who were very familiar came from Europe and North America. Um, institutions that pledge funds were much more likely to be extremely or very familiar with SCOS than those who responded from other organisations, around 45% of those institutions that pledge funds were extremely or very familiar, compared with around 29% from other organisations. Next slide, please. Um, so around, and so coming down then again, you know, 89% of people are familiar with uh, open science infrastructure, 65% of respondents familiar with SCOS in some form, then around 49% of respondents express familiarity with how SCOS operates with the type of model it uses. Um, around the same number, though, were uh, expressed that they were not so familiar or not at all familiar. That was about 49% as well. So a real spread here of people who understand how SCOS operates. The most there, right in the middle, somewhat familiar. So people have an idea about how the, the model operates, but don't consider themselves to be very or extremely familiar with it. Respondents from university libraries were actually more likely to say they were not so familiar than any of the other options. And uh, from pledging institutions, 26% were more likely to express some familiarity than other respondents. Uh, the only respondents uh, who considered they were extremely familiar with how SCOS operates came from Europe, and not so familiar was the most common response from Africa, Asia, and Oceania. So again, in terms of SCOS's geography, there's clearly a greater familiarity with the organization and how it operates within Europe, and to a slightly lesser extent, North America, uh, with other regions expressing not so familiar. Next slide, please, Agatha. Thank you. So the next, uh, I should say, I'm presenting some high level responses here um, and, and talking through a wider breakdown. There were around uh, 30 questions um, and, and we're not showing all of those today, but we will be making the full data set, uh, anonymized data set available uh, in the next few weeks when we finished uh, doing the analysis and preparing it for that. Um, so if you're very interested, you can dive in yourself and have a look at some of the more uh, nuanced responses. Um, so the importance of SCOS then, so we've just talked about familiarity with SCOS and we asked, asked how important people thought SCOS was uh, as a current source of support to open science infrastructure. Around 76% of respondents thought that SCOS is currently important in some form and a majority of those felt it was very important with about the same saying it was extremely or somewhat uh, important. Uh, about 22% of respondents chose don't know 
um, with only 2% saying it was not so important. And that's something we'll return to, this idea that there's, there's more people saying they don't know than expressing that SCOS is not effective or not important or not required in the future as a, as a means of support. And uh, if you dive into those numbers, the, those who say they are not familiar with the SCOS model are those who are then saying they don't know if it's important. Um, those who are familiar then are much more likely to express that they think SCOS is very or extremely important, which is unsurprising. But reassuring to know. Um, the aggregate perspective that you see here, the breakdown is replicated very closely across most regions, but respondents from Europe are more likely to say both that it was extremely important or somewhat important with that very important much lower. So there's a slightly broader response range from Europe than in other regions. Uh, respondents from non-pledging institutions, so those who haven't pledged money to one of the SCOS supported initiatives, um, see SCOS as importantly as, as being as important, sorry, as those who are from pledging institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, effectiveness of SCOS. So, you know, how important is SCOS and how effective is it? Around 60% of the respondents felt that SCOS had been at least somewhat effective in sustaining open science infrastructure. However, the most common response with 39% was don't know. Um, only 2% said that SCOS was extremely effective, or this was twice as many as those who said SCOS was not so effective, but those are small numbers. And again, the don't know is driven by those who say they are not familiar, particularly familiar with SCOS's model or um, the organization itself. Don't know is the most common response for those based in Africa, Asia, Europe and South America. It's the most common response from university libraries and from other organization types when you consider them all together. Um, we, this was one question, again, because we were looking to get as broad a range as possible of responses, we didn't ask too many open text questions, but we did ask people for more details about um, why, they, why they'd expressed an answer here in the way they had. So if they said that it was, SCOS was effective or not so effective, we asked them to tell us a bit more about why. So when they were explaining a positive view of SCOS, you know, saying it was extremely or very effective, people, participants ex expressed that SCOS has increased awareness and drawn more organizations into supporting open science infrastructure. They said that SCOS had both increased funding to initiatives, to those providing open science infrastructure, and increased the amount of funding provided by those who support them. So increased funding overall, but increasing the delta of each individual organization providing funding. Um, that SCOS has raised visibility of open science infrastructure in a whole range of areas. And that by promoting infrastructure globally, which SCOS very firmly does, SCOS has promoted interoperability and confidence that the open science infrastructure is not going to disappear, that, it, that it's persistent and can remain. Um, when asked about this and when somebody was expressing why they hadn't offered a more positive view or explaining a negative view, participants expressed that um, support, support for open science infrastructure through SCOS was still not firmly embedded in institutional budgets and vulnerable to cuts in those budgets. Um, respondents hinted, sorry, I'm reading the word highlighted as hinted, respondents highlighted that there's an imbalance in the geographic base of support and identified in particular the US as not uh, offering a level of support to open science infrastructure that's commensurate or comparable with its research output and dependence on that infrastructure. And then, you know, a familiar point, but a, a very important one is that SCOS hasn't been able to overcome the free rider problem whereby institutions are benefiting from uh, open infrastructure, but are not actually providing support. But that ties with many positive views that actually awareness has been increased and more organizations are providing support. So a, a wide range of different comments, quite a lot of nuance in them. So I'm just trying to give you a head, headlines that we can extract from those responses. Um, I get to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, this was a future need for SCOS. Um, and here, uh, the breakdown is largely replicated across all the different geographic regions and categories. 60% felt that SCOS would be needed for many years in the future. And 22% felt it would be needed for some years. 19% of people felt that they were not sure whether it would be needed. And that correlates again with those who expressed that they were not so familiar with uh, the SCOS operating model or with SCOS itself, but nobody, nobody in the whole survey selected the options that SCOS would not be needed 
for many years to come. So uh, we took that as being a strong sign of support, both for the work SCOS is doing, but also for people's belief that there is a need to provide support to open science infrastructure into the future and potentially for many years to come. Uh, I get to the next slide, please. Uh, open practices, this was the only question where the most common response was that highest one on the Likert scale. So we asked uh, how important people felt it was that SCOS promoted open practices uh, in the organisations it supported, and 44% of respondents felt that was extremely important important and a, th a further 39% responded that it was very important. Um, respondents based in North America and uh, Oceania and specifically the USA and Australia drove that extremely important response while um, Asian and European respondents were in the majority, a majority of those chose very important. So again a slight difference geographically but you know very consistent, extremely strong support that the organization supported should be practicing, not be, be seen to be operating open practices. Next slide, please. Um, other initiatives, we asked about uh, other initiatives because part of this work, well, this works very importantly to support the development of Scottish strategy for the next three years. And we were interested in gaining as broad a picture as the, of who else is providing support to open science infrastructure uh, as possible. And we asked people to name, first of all, whether they could name anyone. And 48% uh, of people said that they could name another organization. And then we asked who they were aware of, who, who they were talking about. Um, the, the highest number of organization, uh, the highest number of respondents named uh, Invest in Open Infrastructure, which is an initiative that many of you may be aware of based in North America uh, that's received funding from Arcadia, I think, a foundation to do research and undertake support of open science infrastructure. And then many other people named uh, national government funds, uh, research funding organizations that operate uh, funds to support open science or open access projects and that provide support to infrastructure projects through those, not necessarily over operating support directly for open science infrastructure, but with project uh, programs that can will will solicit and be interested in applications from open science infrastructure and then lots of collective action initiatives those who are operating in open access and seeking to solve the collective action problem by attracting funding from many parties uh, but also those who are suggested initiatives targeting support for open science infrastructure so again people may be aware of the 2.5 percent initiative or plan i which are um, of, uh, things that have been suggested as possible solutions to the problem of facing open science infrastructure over the last two or three years. Um, we had a wide range of those, and that was extremely helpful in terms of plotting and identifying where SCOS sits in the landscape. Uh, Agatha, next slide, please. Uh, we're coming to the end here, but some interesting things. We, we are some further interesting things. We asked people around where they felt the priorities for funding lay. So I uh, gave them a, a wide range of possible choices as to what kind of open science infrastructure should be pr prioritised for funding and gave them the opportunity to select more than one. So here th th these numbers are not mutually exclusive, but, you know, clearly the, the largest, um, the, the most popular option chosen was open publishing services, tools and platforms. Somebody in the chat I see asked whether publishers are open science infrastructure. I think it depends if you're an open publisher and exactly how you operate, but clearly people feel that open publishing services are the most, should be prioritized the most with fair open access repository services and open, open research data infrastructure and services. The only three receiving, um, being chosen by more than 40% of respondents. Um, university libraries were broadly the same as that breakdown. So if you look at the university libraries and what they would prioritize, a higher number would choose interoperability and information exchange services than would have chosen open research data infrastructure and services. So uh, interoperability moved up. And over 75% of African respondents, so very clear majority, would choose um, fair open access repository services. Um, otherwise, geographically, this pattern that you see here is uh, replicated. Um, and uh, similarly, when you look at types of organization, uh, there's a, a pretty close correlation. But one thing we would identify is that um, only 21% of pledging institutions identified fair open access repository services 
as being particularly important. So the support from them was driven elsewhere. Uh, but those who pledge funding to open science infrastructures through SCOS are, are not uh, choosing fair open access repository services. And I would also add that only 2% we offered another option for everybody and only 2% of respondents chose to select two of the options given and then an other option and, and that's positive because this categorization is one that SCOS has developed and used over time and it's good to see that respondents were able to select their priorities from the list uh, in question. I get to the next slide. Uh, it's the penultimate slide to talk you through. So again, so we asked what types of organisations should be prioritised for funding and then we asked what criteria uh, would you use to choose which organisation, uh, open science infrastructure initiatives to support, you know, when receiving applications, what would you, what criteria would you use to prioritise? And uh, interoperability, community governance and global significance were the standout three options selected. And I think for them personally, it's, you know, those represent the way that uh, an organisation faces outwards, the way it operates, the way it uh, interfaces with other services, the way it represents the community it's serving in its governance arrangements and its and its potential or, or its ability to serve globally and be significant on a global level. The next three most significant choices, again, there's a little shelf there just around 25% to 30%, um, organizational resilience, urgency of need for funding, and the innovation of the solution. They're a bit more internally focused. So, you know, how how well is the organization placed to be viable through different you know, shocks with its resilience, how desperately does it need funding, how, how uh, secure is its current status and the innovation of its solution, is it doing something interesting rather than replicating something that's already in existence. A um, couple of notes just around the breakdown, which is pretty well represented, um, respondents based in Africa very much stress the innovation and solution. Around 65% of respondents in Africa chose that, while those in uh, Asia or Oceania were to would were uh, even more strong a preference up to 85 percent for interoperability um and then the other thing tonight this is an interesting one and, and make no particular comment about it that those from pledging institutions so organizations who have supported infrastructures through scots uh did not see urgency of need for funding as priority only uh, 12 percent uh, of those selected uh, that option. So it was way down from where we see it, about fifth place here, uh, down at the bottom of the uh, breakdown. And then finally, um, just to say, so I said we, we surveyed, uh, we had some specific questions for pledging uh, for the organisations that have pledged funding, and I've, and I've given you an idea in a couple of places of where their responses differed from others. But we also asked organisations who'd applied to SCOS about their experience and um, where they're seeking funds and what they think works well and what doesn't. Um, this breaks down where they have applied for funding for the, you know, they've received support from SCOS, but they've sought support from other places. And um, so we had only 13 respondents, but um, more than 50% of those uh, had applied to national governments or associations of universities and research funders for support. And that corresponds very closely when we asked uh, all respondents who they thought should provide support to open science infrastructure largely it was national governments associations and universities and research funders so there's quite a high correlation between where infrastructure providers have been looking for funding and where people think they should get support from and i think that's everything that i wanted to cover um i apologize slightly that it's a bit of a whistle stop tour but hopefully there's some interesting information there and some insights we've certainly had quite a lot to draw from it and the accompanying focus groups and uh, uh, interviews and are continuing to work, uh, use it to inform the next, well, the SCOS strategy that will be, as Agatha says, uh, launched in the autumn. And uh, with that, I'll hand back to you, Agatha, to move us on to the next section of the talk. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think that I would like to um, ask our panelists uh, for some comments on what you have just shown us, because it was definitely a lot of information. Was there something that particularly caught your attention that you would like to speak to? Yeah, uh, if I may, because okay. there is something in this slide that is still there, which Good. catch my, my attention as I was surprised about the result of this slide in one specific part. I expected that interoperability played a, a good part of the whole story, but having governance 
So community governance so high in the diagram, in the rank, is impressive to me. I mean, I'm positively impressed, but I didn't expect it. Um, I do agree that governance is crucial for open science infrastructures in general, because you need governance, you need to involve the community, the stakeholders in order to have shared goals in the long term and to even to, to kind of organize strategy for sustain the infrastructure in the long term. Uh, and so these, the, having that that, that, that point so high means that we have to work as open science infrastructure directors and managers, we have to work and to pay particular attention to that point, which is exactly one of the, 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 the funders, basically the, the people that, the institution that support us would like to see. Uh, of course, there are different shades, if you want, of, of governance, because there is, uh, let's say, advisory, uh, an advisory way of governance, a, a, an executive way of governance, these kind of things. And that could, should be understood, which is the kind of governance that the community is expecting from op uh, open science infrastructure. But this is a specific point that we have to keep in mind and we have to work on. I think for what concerns open citation, we just started with SCOS in thinking about governance models and we have a long way to go and we have to improve ourselves. But this is clear evidence that this is something we have to strongly work on in the next years. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, that, that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Alec, go ahead. I was just going to piggyback on what Silvio just said. That jumped out at me as well, and it's a thing that we've heard at PKP is that uh, our Alec, we cannot hear you very well. If you could do something with Sorry, your mic. Sorry, fix that now. Okay, good. Now, very good. Sorry, my my level keeps setting itself down. Um, so the community governments is something we hear a lot as well, and so it's something that I'm I'm not surprised to see show up here um, as it has elsewhere. Um, the 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 challenges that we see ourselves as a, a software development. And um, and when you talk about sustainability, it's not a matter of whether a project's sustainable often as what it's sustainable as. And if we are forced to maintain ourselves at a crew and sort of do what we're doing already, then it means that we, we do the software and we don't uh, do things like governance. Um, I'm going to have to fix my audio here. I'm fighting with a volume control, so I'm going to stop there for a moment. Okay. Thank you, Alec. Um, any other remarks? Not necessarily about the, the governance structure. Perhaps there was something else also that, that caught your attention from John's findings here. Maybe a few words about the importance of SCOS. Okay, uh, go ahead, strong yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not from the point of view of the uh, open science infrastructures, but from the point of view of a funder. Mm -hmm. Agatha mentioned in the introduction that I am a university librarian, but I also work as an expert on behalf of the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. And maybe you are aware that we set up two, two years ago a national open science fund. And uh, the idea is to fund mainly uh, French-based uh, infrastructures, French-based platforms. But uh, the ministry also wanted to dedicate a part of the fund towards uh, national, uh, international infrastructures. And uh, in the, we were thinking, how, how will we achieve that? How can we determine which infrastructures need more funding than the others which are uh, more suitable for support and uh, we decided in the end to rely on SCOS uh, analysis on SCOS expertise and this is was really a very big help uh, in determining which uh, infra infrastructures international ones we wanted to support and so the the ministry decided to support for the last year the three uh, infrastructure that are here on the panel and uh, we, we are looking forward to doing to re renewing it uh, in, in for the next uh, cycle. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that we did not do our own assessment, but we did it not on the um, on, on the on the purpose of the infrastructures, but we we looked at how does these infrastructure fit within our own uh, open science plan, which was presented yesterday. Uh, during a panel yesterday afternoon. Um, we also looked at the footprint, the French footprint of the French level of uh, commitment, engagement with these three uh, infrastructures. And then it was a help in defining the level of support, of financial support, but 
uh, first, the first step was to say, okay, we look at what SCOS is doing and we, we rely on it as a trusted uh, partner that bridges the gap between inf open science inf infrastructures and funders and libraries. So I think uh, I, I think I had responded to this uh, poll and I ticked uh, extremely important. <laughs> I'll just add to what Jean-Francois, um, because I think uh, what uh, the French has have done now is really commendable. Um, going beyond its own borders in support. I, I think that's um, something which is extremely valuable. And I think in that sense, SCOS is a very strong instrument and a, a very good example of uh, doing something which has a global perspective, which it should have, I think. Uh, and we can see from the feedback also from the survey that that the global perspective is, is very important. I'd also say that uh, the importance of SCOS of course, has to do with us as infrastructure providers to um, to kickstart relationships with uh, libraries and consortia, to um, engage with this community um, in terms of uh, receiving funding, but also to ensure that we um, then can continue to um, get input for our own developments, and and ensure that we we do things that that uh, point in the right direction that are useful to the community and so as a kickstarter uh, definitely uh, SCOS is fantastic of course as as it was also said in your presentation Agatha the 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 what SCOS is doing is is the beginning and then there's a long road ahead and for our case it's it's definitely true that um, we had a quite low target and so we 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 achieved it fairly quickly, uh, but this is just the beginning of then uh, sustaining these relationships with the libraries and ensuring that that we will um, well uh, also be sustainable in the long run. Thank you, Niels. Um, I think uh, that, that I would like to move a little bit um, more into this direction of, of of the idea of community funding. So if I can ask um, our infrastructures here, how has community funding helped your infrastructures in what, in what way? In what ways was it, was it helpful for you as a model of funding? Uh, well, um, I, I, I will start. Uh, I mean, it was crucial. I'm talking about my personal experience in open citations right now, so I cannot speak for the others, but without uh, that community funding model that SCOS proposed, uh, I'm not sure that open citation would be here. Uh, in that sense, um, see, SCOS acted as a kind of catalyst, okay, for uh, gaining kind of support from interested institution that would like to support us and also to build a community around the service that we provide in order to have stakeholders there. And uh, the funding, the funds that we have received were basically used for having people working actively uh, every day on the technical side, but in particular, something that we really missed before, basically on the administrative side, which is crucial for keeping infrastructure um, alive in the long term. You need an administration, you need people caring about communication stuff, all these kinds of things. And SCOS made it, SCOS and in particular, all the uh, institutions that provided us support, financial support, made it possible, basically. Uh, as I told you, I think, I'm not sure I, I, I would be able to bear if, Commun the communities behind SCOS and all the people that support, all the infrastructure uh, institutions supported us, uh, didn't do it <laughs> in the past few years. Thank you, Silvio. Any other comments coming from our infrastructures? Well, I can just echo what Silvio says. <laughs> I, I'm not sure we would have uh, stayed uh, afloat. I think the urgency for funding, which was also on on um, on the list of uh, priorities. Is, was not high though, uh, but it's it's clear that as a nonprofit organization with no institutional backup, uh, you you need funding from somewhere. And I think it's just great that beyond the funding, 
uh, I think the the support uh, from the wide community and the global community is really an acknowledgement that we are doing something which is useful and meaningful, and and it's uh, uh, that's I think is 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 a very good sign. And and then that these uh, libraries and consortia uh, have uh, seen the necessity for open infrastructures, although there are. Uh, many many infrastructures that are not uh that are out there uh, already working but supporting open infrastructures i think that's really something which uh has become high on the agenda i think that's um, some of the great feedback for us as well and, and from i see that you would like to say something yeah go ahead yeah i'm hoping i'm not wrestling with my volume control here anymore i'm literally pulling the lever back and forth with it it looks like it's okay now um so from pkp's perspective and i'm here from the development team as the head of the development team when we applied for the program um, my hope was that we could allocate some funding to work on solving problems in the code which is where i spend my time of course and we didn't do that and um, i think that's actually a very sensible decision we um were we were established in 1998 and so we've had a long history as a project and so in some sense we've demonstrated that we're sustainable um the question is as i was trying to say last time uh, is how like what we're sustainable as what that project looks like looks like and what our future is going to be so what we did is we um we've invested in to some business development and into um re re renewing our membership program um, and the goal there is to not just treat SCOS as another grant funding cycle where we have a chance to get some funds, uh, albeit much less, um, much many fewer strings attached than many of the grants do because they tend to be for specific tasks and it's very hard to fund maintenance. Um, we look at it as a chance to spring to a different kind of sustainability and to make sure that we can uh, resolve some longstanding issues. One of those is governance. Uh, one is things that are very hard to fund. Um, accessibility is one. And then the third is, Coming from a software background, uh, my my background is one of open source software first and library. Uh, I've had to learn the library uh, sit here on the job. Um, there is an open source a feeling of libertarian, you know, meritocracy, all these kinds of things. And I think when you mentioned that there's a, a lack of input from American uh, institutions, um, that's the states, not Canada. Um, I think that's because the philosophy there is very much one of this kind of meritocracy, duocracy kind of thing. And it's really hard to fund certain kinds of things that are crucial in that. One is accessibility. Um, and there's also a problem of equity and inclusion in that kind of resourcing. So we're looking at this as an opportunity to transform the way that we are sustained, because we, I would say we are sustainable, into a form that is able to focus better on those things that are, that are crucial. And I, I've got examples of ways in which software is failing because those specific things are very hard to fund using the grant cycle and the kind of failure based funding. That Great, thank you, Alex. Um, Alec, um, I wanted to, uh, what I hear here is, uh, I have to say I'm very pleased with your answers, uh, that uh, I guess that uh, it was a very positive uh, journey for you with SCOS. However, I am sure that there were some obstacles. So I would also like to ask about, about uh, a darker side of, of this experience of collective funding. Um, have you encountered any sort of obstacles? And if so, how did you deal with them? And also, also already reaching out to our, our audience. Perhaps you also have some ideas of how to make this journey easier in the future. And if so, if you would like to speak to that um, and to these experiences, please raise your hand and we will, we will come back to you. So going back to our infrastructures, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more about <laughs> the dark side. So um, let's say that the, 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 to start was a bit difficult for me, still personal opinion, but uh, I'm a scholar. And I co-direct Open Citation before SCOS with David Shutton, which we are still co-directing it. And we are both scholars with no experience in ad any administrative stuff you can imagine. And so suddenly we, we, we have had to start to talk with administration of possible supporters in order to understand how to get the funds save them somewhere where it was not entirely clear at the very beginning and in, in which form, how to collect these funds. So I, I really started to basically do another business at a certain point, instead of being professor at the university, I started to understand how to address all these 
things that are totally out of my scope, let's say. That was the difficult part. I mean, I didn't have any, any prior knowledge in that. Luckily, my university supported me in several stuff, administrative and legal stuff, because there is also the legal part, which is not easy at all. And I had uh, people here within the university who supported me in kind, basically speaking. And that was another value that I had here at the University of Bologna. And I was lucky, I have to confess. But that part was very difficult and and everything started to be, to say, better and smooth, if you want, when we were able to, to hire the, the administrative person responsible for open citation, thanks to the donation that we have received, because from that point in time, there was a specific person caring about this stuff. And so I could start again to work on the things I'm expert in and not uh, to reinvent myself in dealing with this, uh, this stuff. So the starting point for us that we were a young organization, basically, we, we were only two people, was kind of nightmare, but we addressed it at the end. So it worked. Great. I'm happy that worked. Uh, so <laughs> I hope that by now, it's a, it's a very pleasant dream rather than, uh, than a nightmare, Silvio. So any other dark sides and obstacles that you would like to speak to? Well, I, we didn't face that obstacle as, as Silvio, but I think um, one which I think is, is quite sort of predictable is that it, it can decision-making processes at libraries and consortia are, are fairly long. And and uh, I know that from 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 my own library experience and, and being in a, a, a consortium. So I mean that's that's uh, nothing unusual. Uh, but of course you can be very anxious waiting for decisions uh, for a long time. Um, but I would say I, I I don't really think there are any dark sides. But I I think uh, maybe there are some concerns uh, looking ahead again, because I I I really think that uh, and we are very. Uh, grateful to all, all the support we've uh, got but i think uh, also speaking from my experience that a lot of this funding has sort of come up uh, on a um, ad hoc basis uh, rather than being a, let's say a budget line in the library budget and i think that's uh, so two years ahead i i, I think the real uh, challenge is, is ahead of us whether we will be able to renew and and sustain the support so, so uh, I mean, you can ask me again in two years' time. <laughs> we'll see. I will. I will. Um, Jean-Francois, if I can ask you, because you have a different perspective on this, uh, from the perspective yeah. of a funder, uh, what, what, what has been uh, difficult? Uh, well, I, I will maybe take the hat of university librarian now, not, not the uh, central uh, open science fund, but from the library perspective, I think there are also some administrative hurdles. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as librarians, we are used to buy subscriptions, to buy book, to purchase. Uh, we are not used to make donations. Uh, and in some countries, depending on the legal issues, you, you, you are not, it, it is quite difficult on an administrative level not to buy something, but to make a donation to an association, uh, an infrastructure. So one of the way of uh, smoothing, smoothing things and uh, making them more easy, I think, is the, the role of, of library consortia. Uh, and for the moment, for in, in France, so there is the, the French Open Science Fund, but uh, libraries also contribute to SCOS. And for the moment, uh, they have to, to deal individually with each open science infrastructure that they, they, are, uh, uh, they want to support. So the, the consortium is advertising uh, SCOS, but is not making the payment on behalf of its members. So I think that for some libraries, it is too, too high an obstacle. They don't want to, to, to be bothered with administrative and legal issues. And so this will change next year in 2022. Normally the French consortium will be able to uh, make the, the payment on behalf of, these, of the members. So it's much more easier when you pay your annual fee to your consortium, you just have to tick a box. I want also to support UAB and uh, Open Citations PKP, and then you have a global payment to your consortium, and the consortium make uh, uh, only one payment to the uh, uh, infrastructure. So it's easier for the libraries. It's easier for the uh, infrastructure. So I think this is uh, also a, 
very pra practical <laughs> uh, um, point of view, something that would be make life easier uh, on the library part. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, Vanessa, I see a lot of nodding coming from you. Would you, would you like to speak to, to that? To the administrative hurdles, because it seems to be a, a, a big issue, not to well, not it really to can be, and it, it also really depends on uh, the country we're talking about, how research is is funded, organised, what what countries are are uh, able to fund, and sometimes if um, if the infrastructure doesn't have a, a a price a price tag, they they can't contribute. So. So it's really important to raise awareness of the of the need, and um, I think there is uh, a, an interest from research funders and from other government governments who would like to contribute, but the legal structures currently don't allow them to do that. So by helping raising awareness of this and getting them to perhaps review that and to look a little bit, bit further down the line, going back to what Neil says, what what's frustrating if you're in infrastructure you need that you need that funding soon but if we look at the success for the open infrastructure going forward in the medium to long term that's what we really need um, and we have seen actually over the last few years there has been change in this area and we do for example see certain countries like France or Switzerland or Canada who didn't have um, the um, consistent commitment to open infrastructure. And now they have this as a standing item year on year to look at what are they going to be funding. And sometimes they use SCOS as, as a, um, a place of recommendation. So who are we going to fund going forward? So that is huge progress because that means that uh, nations and their, their library consortia are um, making longer term commitments and that's going to help sustain our whole, whole ecosystem so i think that's really vital it's true it it does take time and yet uh so if, so if that's the bigger vision that we would like in the meantime though if everybody realized that all we need often is the cost of an apc which many libraries are paying and not just one if you contributed one APC, the cost of an APC to an infrastructure, and if many of us did that, we would be reaching these targets in no time. So we are exceptionally grateful to so, so many of you who've contributed. So I think it's more than 280 um, organizations. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. So just coming back to who. And we also, and some of those numbers, actually one number has contributed half a million euros. Okay, so this is not one particular library admittedly, but it's, you know, the, the, the French consortium. But um, so, um, so what we can do, aside from looking at the, the longer term vision, individual libraries, can contribute with small with small sums uh, and can make small donations, ideally through their consortia, because as somebody already just said, um, the overheads are so much smaller. If you can do it via consortia for those infrastructures, having to invoice you know, hundreds of, of libraries, that's ideally not what we want. So this is what we've also been trying to promote, get together, if you get together also in a library consortium, you also get a discount. So, you know, that's also something that where you can also help contribute to that open uh, infrastructure ecosystem. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, I think that um, I very much uh, like um, this, um, this thought that you had that uh, it's uh, very often it's the cost of an APC. It really gives you a very good, uh, a good idea of what, what, what kind of uh, contributions we're talking about. Um, and I think that, that that's, it's a very good mental visual to have in mind. Um, but um, coming back, because you, we talked a lot about, about certain numbers, of course, we are very happy that uh, we managed to, to go over 3 million euros right now with, with SCOS campaigns. Um, but at the same time, uh, and we have over 280 institutions pledging, but if we look at this in the global perspective, 
it's okay, it's good, but it's not really that that many institutions still. Um, so Vanessa, how, how do you explain that? Uh, what about these institutions who are still, you know, uh, not doubtful about collective funding? What would make them change their mind in one way or another? What would you what would you say to that? Because I know that you have you have immense experience uh, dealing with these institutions. And then I, will, I, I also ask Jean-Francois about this from his for his perspective. So look, I, I do think that we've really moved uh, quite some mountains already. Um, if, if you look at the funds that have been raised and that if you see some of those countries that ha have now committed with a number of uh, libraries and consortia. So that's, you know, uh, uh, an amazing achievement. Um, and that many libraries, even at the time of COVID, are stepping up and are contributing because they see the importance of open science. Um, but, you know, this is a cultural change. Again, in some countries, legally, they, they're not able to, or research funders aren't able to uh, contribute as they'd like. So those structures need changing. Um, but otherwise, we just, we need to plug away. We need to raise awareness. We need to, I think what's something that we could do as libraries, because um, often we, we, we just think, oh, that infrastructure, that's never going to be, never go, going to go away. That, that's been there you know, for ages and it will continue. But if, uh, and I think it was something that Peter Suber said, who, who we interviewed, um, he said, what libraries need to do is to actually sit down and uh, note what infrastructures are they using, which services, I mean, they know which services or journals they're paying for, but what about the infrastructures and what do they really depend, depend on? And do they know about the financial security of that infrastructure? And then are they actually contributing to that infrastructure that they depend upon? So I think that could also help move others to just contribute, you know, an APC or two uh, on an annual basis to some of those infrastructures and maybe to some of the, the infrastructures they use, but not only those that they use, those that others may use in the global south because this is an ecosystem, a global one that we want to support, yeah? So I think uh, that that can stimulate others. And, you know, we know that this takes time. It's, it's cultural change that we're talking about, you know, but, you know, uh, sharing experiences, saying that it's not difficult um, and, um, you know, remembering it's just an APC, yeah? So that can also, I, I think, really help. Thank you, Vanessa. And speaking about sharing these uh, successful stories of, of collective funding for open science infrastructures, again, uh, calling on the audience, if there is someone who would like to share uh, a success story with us, that would be absolutely fantastic. We would like to also see um, how, um, how other institutions, how other infrastructures deal uh, deal with the, ch the challenge of, of, of sustainable funding, because of course, SCOS is just one of the, of, of the available models and options. Um, there was another theme that um, came um, um, as something important, and I think, John, you spoke to this, when we talked about um, different criteria for funding. And uh, Silvia, you picked up on the importance of, uh, of the community governance there. So uh, I would like to ask you uh, the, to the infrastructures now. So how important is community governance for your infrastructures? And has it changed uh, over time? I think that, Silvia, you already touch them upon it that uh, partially I, I would dare to say thanks to SCOS, uh, to the SCOS experience, you actually started thinking more about this aspect of, um, of your initiative. How do, how do others think about it? Well, definitely, if I think about open citations without SCOS, uh, we be, probably we, we, we haven't started to think about the governance. Uh, governance is one of the key point of the principle for open, of open scholarly infrastructures, uh, and it is one of the point we are not entirely compliant with because we are working on that. On that, it is a process, okay? And SCOS basically was responsible for allow us to kickstart that process, okay? Uh, we started with just two directors and nothing else. And thanks to SCOS, we have started to build the, 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 the governance by adding right now 
an advisory board of representatives from very different institutions, um, and also a council, which is the, um, let's say, uh, the, the group of all the Open Citation members who join us as members of Open Citations that um, basically are our two units that allow us to govern somehow uh, right now Open Citations, even if they act uh, in, in advisory capacity right now. So what we are trying to work on in during this year and the next year is to even evolve again our uh, our governance in order to include a, a new unit there like an executive unit which i think that we would really like to have because we truly believe that open citation as an open infrastructure should be governed by the community right now only the directors have uh, let's say the executive power and these must change and will change in the future Absolutely. Thank you, Silvio. Um, Alec, anything from... Oh, Niels, sorry, Niels, you were, you were going oh, I for I just wanted it. to um, <laughs> say that this, I think this GOS campaign actually, um, quite as Silvio says, has, has put an emphasis on, on the, the governance part and the community engagement uh, in governing our infrastructure. O OAPEN and, and DYB have, have grown, uh, let's say, organically over a number of years. And and uh, it's been a struggle also to maintain uh, operations. And so it's really been about uh, working hard to, to ensure that operations were going. And now suddenly we have much more attention from many more institutions, which uh, gives us another kind of responsibility or it makes it more clear at least. So I think uh, now is a very good time to, uh, to um, be in a dialogue with this community about how they want to engage with us and how we can ensure that the investment that they um, put in us, that it's it's uh, something that we then develop together. So that's, I think the, the community part will, will be also the way that we sustain our activities in the long run, because then we will uh, be adaptive to the needs of that community so definitely they they need to be part of our governance structure and we are also now really looking into this and trying to develop in in a way that um adheres to the principles of um, open scholarly infrastructure thank you uh, vanessa i can see your hand up yeah, so I, I think this is also so our, uh, with our conversations with the open science community, there is a, a much greater drive for more transparency, diversity and inclusivity, and they, and they also want to have a say. So if they are considering funding, they want to be able to uh, be closer to the services that they care about and to see that there are at least options to do that. And um, so passing that on is really important. Uh, and I think in response to that, you know, there are others, there are um, libraries who are contributing funding to that. And uh, recently there was a, a country that approached us who said, you know, there are many university libraries potentially who could be interested, but we would like to understand more about the governance of each of those infrastructures before we make a decision. So this is how important uh, community governance is for many libraries. Um, and so, and I believe that every single of those infrastructures could positively and how um, funding uh, uh, in anytime soon. I think it's really vital. Alec, yes. Uh, I just want to echo a lot of what we've heard about kind of grassroots organizations. I think a lot of the um, under sustained uh, necessary infrastructure is grassroots uh, in its initiation. And then has grown to a point where, you know, those of us who were previously working at the keyboards are also doing some level of, you know, grant writing, administration, management, community de development, all that sort of thing. Um, one thing that's 
becoming clear to us, we, we've been struggling with how to articulate our governance and decision making for quite a while within PKP. And this is kind of a reflection of it we're seeing here in the uh, importance on community um, uh, governance in the survey results. Often what that feels like to, to us is that we'll approach a group to say, hey, can you help sustain us in what we're doing to help you to publish, for example. And then the response we'll get is, uh, yes, but also here's some things we'd like you to do. And uh, that's a, a sensible thing for us to expect, given that someone's looking to fund something they're already using and it's perceived as being free. Um, but I think what we're coming to understand more is that the role for us in establishing what the community governance looks from a broad perspective, not just from you know PKP saying, here's our priorities given our stakeholders, um, but saying, at a consortial level, you know, Vanessa, you mentioned consortia, uh, we're seeing a lot of groups start to pick up and use our tool set at the national levels or even the international levels. Within Europe, there's a number of different national portals. And that consortial view, in addition to helping the funding environment, uh, it sounds quite a bit, um, also helps us to, to engage with community at a, a higher level and to better structure you know, community needs and to respond to them and to, to have some of the, the lower levels of support um, managed by, by those those national levels and the consortial levels. So um, there are some shared responsibilities that I think if you're looking to fund an open source or open science um, project that still remain community based. Um, it's not a matter of comparing a commercial publishing service where you pay and they do. It's still a matter of what's shared and what where do you need to step up. So um, the governance model, I think, is expectations being set on both sides. Absolutely. Um, I also would like to ask uh, the audience if there are other infrastructures in the room. Uh, do, do you actually have governance structures that bring funders to the table, and do they do they work well? Do they do they do, do they actually um, um, uh, do funders actually contribute to these uh, to these uh, government structures? And uh, that brings me back to Jean Francois here. So, from your perspective, so from from a funder perspective, um, how 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 would you see this engagement in in the in the community governance? Uh, how would you like to contribute to the infrastructures that you choose to support? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I I think that uh, community governance uh, has already it has already been said is uh, quite crucial. Um, it is good in itself uh, because it is also a way of uh, avoiding uh, the, the infrastructure from being purchased uh, by uh, commercial players, for instance. But I think it is also an incentive for funders and for libraries to first talk about the library perspective and then from the funder perspective. From the library perspective, it is now quite agreed that the library is legitimate in uh, not only purchasing uh, books and subscriptions for its uh, patrons, but also in having a say in building repositories, uh, be it uh, open archives, uh, re research data uh, repositories. But when, when it comes to funding something that is outside of the, of the university, something that is outside of the uh, uh, yeah of the of the day-to-day -day, uh, work you can say that okay you, you it's invisible it needs funding but you also need some incentive and I think that uh, community governance and have a say uh, is a quite a good incentive there are there could be several layers of uh, level of engagement uh, for instance in open citations you could be uh, just as um, uh, member and then you have different levels of uh, uh, responsibilities and uh, possibilities of uh, getting involved and then with the uh, funder hat for the French Open Science Fund uh, the, the support for open citations is if I take again this uh, example has been also decided because there was uh, the ministry saw there a possibility of building some kind of partnership uh, also for researchers, French researchers that are working on scientometrics and bibliometrics. And uh, this year in, in spring, we had the first uh, workshop for one day between uh, people from uh, uh, open citations and uh, different uh, research teams uh, from, uh, from French universities and research organisms under the umbrella of the French ministry. So it was uh, the, the the support, the initial idea of supporting 
this open science infrastructures uh, led uh, to, to possible partnerships and research partnerships. So uh, maybe this is not feasible at the university or the library level, but when you talk about uh, level of the country, this comes up to quite uh, interesting uh, perspectives. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, that opens a whole new horizons again. Um, coming back uh, to, to the collective funding models, uh, and now this is going to be a big question uh, to pretty much, we, we, are, we are close to, to the hour here. So I wanted to ask you about the future. So is collective funding the model towards a more sustainable future, do you think? What, are there any limitations? Are there better models? How, how do you see that? Well, I, I like to, to sketch an answer is a kind of big question, honestly. I, I don't think to have the, the, the truth here, but um, I think that the collective funding model is the right way to go. I mean, it allows, well, now there is cost that is, as I told you before, is a kind of catalyst to help us in advertising ourselves to the community. But at a certain point, SCOS, uh support to us will stop because it has a, you know a specific duration what happens next that's the point so uh, the, the good thing about scos is that by using this kind of collective funding model involving and building de facto a community around the service it enable basically it provides right tools to still continuing these kind of relationships with the institution that are supporting us right now, even in the future, even after SCOS stops its support to our, us as infrastructure. So I really don't see a, another viable solution in the long term, which is um, ethical, ethically close to our, uh, our goal in a sense that uh, we want to provide all, all our services for free, for all, without any constraints, without having any fee. And I think this approach is the only viable uh, uh, solution that we have to be sustained in the long term. Thank you, Silvio. Anybody else maybe, would like to- Maybe I can add. So, so I, I don't think that there is a, so in the future, well, firstly, what what other models will come up in the future? But if we think ahead, I think it's important that we don't rely on one, solely one model. So there can be many models that work. And I, and, um, I do think, uh, like Silvio, the collective funding model is very important because it's it feeds into the community-based governed uh, infrastructure. Um, if you think about um, a simple sustainable solution, you could say, well, if the government, if the government, uh, the government X of, of country X uh, funds us for the next five years, you know, that's that's a sustainable a solution. We'd be very happy. We wouldn't have to put any energy into raising funds. But then you lose that community. You don't build that community. You don't understand the needs of the community. So, um, I do think that uh, more sustainable, uh, more structured funding from governance, government governments and research funders plus community funding from libraries and others, um, a combination um, uh, I, I, I think is important. But I do think there are gonna be interesting new models, there already are also for OA Diamond and, and other infrastructures there um, uh, that will come up and that we need to experiment with and to, to see, um, see what works. And I think we need to share more on that to build capacity. Uh, uh, around how to sustain um, our infrastructures and to, to make sure that it you know stays in our hands uh, and, and doesn't um, um, come behind a paywall. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, um, the last uh, the last question for the panel. Um, so I, I would like to. Ask, we're talking so much uh, about open science infrastructures in 
in this context of them being somewhat invisible uh, within the scholarly um, community, the scholarly um, ecosystem. So how could we raise awareness of these invisible infrastructures? How can we make sure that people actually see the invisible? Uh, I, I'll jump in. Um, I would say that they're not invisible to everyone. Um, I think everyone who is at an institution, for example, who's using any of our tool sets, they know they're using them, but they aren't necessarily at the level of decision making that has the power to, to control funding decisions. Um, what is invisible is the fragility sometimes of those projects and the fact that they may not have the funding to do what they need or want to do. Um, and that fragility will always become visible at some point, you know, or it takes for uh, and then your voice heard. So I think what's necessary is a cultural change. And we've been pushing at this for a long time, aspirationally with some success, which is of, for example, the idea for a developer in a university library stop being a foreign idea. Uh, and I think we're seeing that transition take, take hold. And that, that means that somebody who understands and works with the tools that we produce as open tools can make the argument up their ladder in management that there is something worth doing, something worth growing, something worth, something worth investing in. And that's where we see when there is community ownership and community governance, that's where it most naturally flourishes. It's the higher level, the decision making, the um, investment from above that. Thank you very much, Alec. I think that this is a perfect closing line uh, to the panel. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for all your thoughts here. Um, hopefully, um, we will come out of this uh, of this discussion with uh, a little bit more awareness of um, of the the invisible infrastructures, which perhaps might become less invisible um, and the importance on, of, of uh, funding them and of finding models, not necessarily just one model, but many models that could work for them is something that, um, that first of all requires the engagement from the community. And this is what we would like to ask from the community uh, pretty much to, to do. Thank you very much for today. And uh, if you have any questions, please, you can contact, uh, contact me, you can contact SCOS, and we will be happy to, um, to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye have bye. a nice evening. Bye.